know girls like you. It's 2015, and I'm on a date with a dipshit, as per usual. <laughs> I sink my third beer. Internally, my heart is rotting, preparing myself to hear yet another guy say how he's never dated anyone so tall, <laughs> who has strong opinions and even stronger ethnic eyebrows. <laughs> I turn on the charm. Oh yeah, I bat my eyelashes. I pretend to get lost in his sad cul-de-sac eyes. <laughs> You're unconventionally attractive, he says. Wow. I'm too exhausted and frankly too drunk to un unpack this statement. A statement I've heard some version of ever since I started dating. What I've interpreted it to mean is, you're not like the girls I've been told I should like, and since I'm about to kiss you, that makes me alternative and brave. <laughs> I smile and say, you think that's a compliment, but it's not. <laughs> Buy me another drink. <laughs> While he's ordering, I take a look at my phone. I've got 20 minutes until I need to leave to go do stand-up. I meet him at the bar, drink the beer, and say, I gotta go do a show. Can I come? Absolutely not. <laughs> I head to Piano Fight, which I had been coming to since it opened in 2014. At that time, it was still under construction. There were no theaters upstairs yet, but there were rooms in the basement where I took improv classes. I figured that after six weeks of learning how to play all the games from Whose Line Is It Anyway, I'd never see this place again. Comedy venues are fleeting. After one or two shows, you tend to move on quickly. However, Piano Fight's basement, stuffed to the gills with old costumes, became one of the most popular comedy venues in the Bay Area. I ended up here most nights of the week, doing improv and stand-up. Some nights were better than others. For example, I co-hosted a variety show with someone I dated called Bubblegum Garbage Party. <laughs> During the course of the show, I had to wear roller skates, pretend to be a baby, and act like this was everything I dreamed of. <laughs> One night after a particularly rough and low attended skate around the stage, I came out to the Piano Fight Bar, which was packed because Sketchfest was happening. Sketchfest was a showcase of comedy that I had been repeatedly rejected from. <laughs> I saddled up to the bar to drown my sorrows when I looked to my left and Eugene Merman was there. He's the voice of Gene <laughs> in Bob's Burgers, guys. <laughs> Being 25, naive, and overly confident, I tapped him on the shoulder and said, I love your comedy. Can I buy you a shot? And he said, yeah. <laughs> I bought him a shot. He drinks bourbon, by the way. And he generously continued the conversation, asking if I did comedy. I said I do. Then I reflected on the improv, the roller skating, the diaper I had been wearing just 20 minutes before, and said, but it's not going well. How long have you been doing it, he asked. I answered, three years. He said, oh, don't worry. It won't pay off until 10 years in. You got time. We cheers, did our shots, and then he disappeared into the night. Legend has it. If you order a bourbon at the bar, you can still hear Eugene Merman say, 10 years. <laughs> Next stop on my 10-year path, getting dumped <laughs> by the co-host of Bubblegum Garbage Party. <laughs> Uh, it seemed bad at first, but two nice things came out of this. I no longer had to do bubblegum garbage party. <laughs> yes, yes. And I got custody of piano fight in the breakup. Yeah. <laughs> yes, huge. Because of the show, I had found a place at piano fight. All the bartenders knew my name, my drink order, and that my go-to pre-show snack was a caprese salad. Feeling comfortable with my newfound family at the bar, I pitched a show, one that I did with another comedian called TGIF, where we cut the sound on old sitcoms and had com comedians improvise new lines. We got pretty popular and drew solid crowds. 
when we applied for Sketchfest and got in, I was elated for a second. <laughs> Although my show had gotten in, I had also applied to get my own comedy set on a separate show on the festival. On the same day, I found out TGIF the show had gotten into the festival. I found out that I, the comedian, had once again been rejected. So even though our show would be a part of the festival, I wouldn't be able to perform solo. Whatever. 10 years, I thought. <laughs> I went back to my life of comedy shows, comically bad dates, and hanging out at the Piano Fight Bar. One night before a show, I arrived early. I took out my notebook, settled in for a drink, and waited for artistic inspiration to hit. While I was writing, Rob Brady, artistic director of Piano Fight himself, came up to me and said, <coughs> Sam, do you act? <laughs> Funny he should ask. I had just blown an audition at Piano Fight weeks before. I blew it so badly that I laughed and nearly cried during it <laughs> and said, God, <laughs> this is rough for all of us. <laughs> so the answer was, yes, I did act. I told Rob, and he said, great, they're casting comedians for this play. You seem like you'd be good for it. Eventually, I heard from the director of the play who wanted me to come in for an audition. Rather than preparing a monologue, he said, I could just do my stand-up. For those of you who haven't auditioned, it's a nerve-wracking experience. You're performing with your full heart in a small room for one to two people who have watched actors perform all day and are tired and know within seconds if they're going to cast you for the role. Even the best audition circumstances are still not ideal. I leave everyone sweating and wondering if I should have just become a funeral director, like a middle school career test suggested I should. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, still time. Uh, so imagine those already stressful circumstances, then think about performing stand-up for one person. When I met Rem, the director of the play I was auditioning for, it was just him and a table in the room I'd done improv in years earlier. I quickly realized that doing stand-up for one person has all the vulnerability of doing a strip tease for someone who's not into you. <laughs> just stripping off layers for a person who's smiling politely. A couple weeks later, while hungover on BART, <laughs> I heard back that despite my perceived awkwardness, I had gotten the part in the play which was called Forking, like fucking, get it? <laughs> the, the play was set in the 90s and about a group of people in their 20s living together a la friends. The twist with Forking is that it was a choose your own adventure experience for the audience. And that's where I came in. Well, me and the co-host of the play, Jake. We'd rile up the crowd and get the audience's vote on what they wanted to see. When there was some heavy flirtation between two characters, we'd come out from backstage and say something like, Oh, shit! Sh should they kiss? <laughs> Obviously they should kiss. They should always kiss. Speaking of kissing, I was definitely kissing Jake off stage. We had started dating the second week of rehearsals when Jake invited the cast out to karaoke, but I was the only one who ended up making it. We sang Eminem and Lisa Loeb to each other in an empty bar on a Tuesday night. The conversation flowed for hours with no effort at all. Jake was a teacher who, like me, was from a small town, went to school for writing, and liked to have a good time. Rather than make weird backhanded compliments about my appearance, he, get this, asked me questions, <laughs> listened to what I had to say, <laughs> and reacted. <laughs> This guy was wild. <laughs> when I went up to order a drink at one point, the bartender said, I'm rooting for you guys. <laughs> it was just like the play where the bartenders were our own Sam and Jake telling us to kiss. So we did. But we promised each other we wouldn't tell anyone else in the cast we were dating because you didn't want to seem unprofessional. <laughs> Imagine being a, in a play whose name is a euphemism for fucking and worried about being unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> Though I struggled to find anything wrong with Jake and loved all the time we were spending together, I didn't think it'd be anything serious. I had just gotten out of a relationship and Jake told me he could never see himself getting married. 
I figured the show would end and with it our romance, but that wasn't the case. After dating a few months, we moved in together, but Piano Fight was definitely our second home. Jake wrote and acted in plays here, while another comedian and I hosted a sleepover themed show where we did presentations on our celebrity crushes. Jake still never left, even when he found out that I have the biggest crush on Pete Davidson. <laughs> We hosted a Christmas spectacular together that my mom came to. When she saw Piano Fight for the first time and finally understood everything we had talked about for years, she told Jake and I, you should get married here. So four years after we started dating, in the room that I had taken improv classes in when this very theater was still sawdust, in the room I did my stand-up striptease for one man to get a role in a play, in the room where I first met the love of my life, after my sleepover show, in a robe and a tie-dye shirt, I proposed to Jake, and he said yes. <laughs> Last year marked 10 years since I started doing stand-up. I think about what Eugene Merman said a lot, that it takes 10 years for stand-up to pay off. Being back here at Piano Fight, the place that made me believe what I'm doing is worth seeing, surrounded by people who love and support me, no matter what my accomplishments are, I can tell you that he was right. Thank you. Give it up for your girl, Sam DeSalvo.